Hi friends, thank you for joining us again for the ASP Stories weekend bonus episode. Join us on Mondays and Thursdays where we interview amazing guests where they share with us about their adventure sports and the amazing feats that they have done. But ASP Stories is where we get to listen in as authors read their adventure stories to us. So sit back with your hot cup of tea or coffee and kick off your adventure-filled weekend by listening in while we hear more from ASP Stories. Greetings, Adventure Sports Podcast listeners. This is Brian Snyder of Santa Barbara, California, getting ready to share with you a tale from my Off the Map trilogy of adventure books. Each collection showcases the best of the many bad decisions I've made in pursuit of the most surreal and scenic outdoor experiences our planet has to offer. Today's story comes from the first book, Off the Map, 55 Weeks of Adventuring in the Great American Wilderness and Beyond. Emphasis has to go to the beyond part of the title this week, for the tale takes place in the Norwegian high country. I was attempting to climb the highest peak in northern Europe, but my enthusiasm for fickle weather was definitely on the wane by the time this story begins. Hope you enjoy it. Week 5. An Ill Wind Blows Here we are, said the driver, and the feeling of dread that had been building inside me for the last ten miles consolidated into outright fear. I stepped out into freezing rain at the road junction and gave the man a weak smile. As he drove away, I frantically tried to search in my backpack for waterproof gear before I was completely soaked. This had to be the worst place I'd ever tried to hitchhike from. Just 30 minutes ago, I was standing at ease in the warm sunlight. Here, a fierce wind was whipping across a gray, lifeless lake, and there wasn't a single piece of vegetation higher than a blade of grass that could stall its passage. I shivered beneath a road cut, trying ineffectually to thumb down a ride, and feeling the wind steadily force rainwater through the fibers of my supposedly waterproof jacket. Under this dark, depressing sky, the same thought kept repeating itself over and over in my head. I can't believe you did this to yourself again. The primitive fear that possessed me was a consequence of three events from the previous 48 hours, all of which centered upon Galdhold Peking, Norway's highest mountain. I hitched to the trailhead one rainy evening in the car of a Swedish chef, no joke, intending on a morning assault if the weather was favorable. The treeless landscape there was quite peculiar. Freezing and thawing of the alpine tundra had created a region of 10 foot by 10 foot raised terraces with shallow moats running between them. They looked like spaces on a giant game board, and I pitched my tent up top one of the squares, crawled into my sleeping bag, and waited for sleep to come. That's when the real assault began. A gale came howling down from the slopes of Galdholpigan and laid siege to my shelter, pummeling the roof until the tent fabric beat aggressively down upon my head. The aluminum poles slowly bent under the stress, and after two hours of punishment, my tent gave up the fight and laid down submissively before the storm. Even guy lines reinforced with boulders failed to help the tent retain any dimensionality. I ended up wrapped like a burrito inside nylon fabric. I was unable to sleep until the storm subsided at 6 a.m., despite wearing earplugs. At least it didn't rain. Galdopigan was still shrouded by clouds the next day, but I was determined not to spend another night at this elevation, so I set off regardless. Climbing Norway's highest mountain involves crossing the Stigabreen Dangerous Glacier. Dangerous because of the deep cracks that develop in its surface and become covered by snow in wintertime. A trailhead sign warns, under sufficient weight, the snow bridges collapse and you fall into the crevasses. If you are not secured by a rope, you will fall until your head gets stuck between the ice walls 50 to 20 meters down in the crevasse. And if that isn't enough, some survive such falls, but not for very long, for cold water runs down the walls and you will freeze to death quickly without help. Well, considering that 150 people had been guided to the summit earlier that day, I figured that the safest path across the glacier would be easy to locate and follow. The wind was savage as I approached Stigabreen Glacier, but I wasn't in the mood to be bullied by it any longer. For the first part of the crossing, my boots kept breaking through a thin layer of snow and falling into pools of slush. Soon they were thoroughly saturated. The crevasses I encountered were all narrow and avoidable, thankfully, so the real challenge was maintaining my focus while being completely surrounded by the color white. White snow, white fog, everything. 
My eyes were starved for contrast. So when I glimpsed the black rocks of the summit ridge, I was relieved, far more than when I reached the cold, rain-lashed summit itself. After that questionable exercise, I was determined to camp at lower elevations below timberline where the wind wouldn't be as fierce. But after three miles of descent from the trailhead without any hitchhiking traffic, I reluctantly decided to pitch my tent on a calm, comfortable, grassy hillside next to a gentle brook surrounded by contented sheep. At midnight, I bid them goodnight and quickly fell asleep, exhausted. Thus lulled into complacency, the attack at 2 a.m. was doubly frightening to me. High winds barreled into my tent, flattening it completely so that I could feel the impact of every raindrop against my face. I tried to hide at the bottom of my sleeping bag, but one peek outside the hood convinced me that I could not afford to act childishly and ignore what was happening. Puddles were forming inside the tent. This was a survival situation. I had to start bailing now. Rain was pouring in everywhere, and I had to sacrifice clothes to soak up water while simultaneously fighting the collapsing ceiling. I needed to hold out for as many hours as I could, at least until daylight so I could entertain the hope of getting a ride off this accursed mountain. In the meantime, however, I knew that my wet sleeping bag was inexorably pushing me towards a state of hypothermia. Just before that critical time arrived, I stopped bailing and began to painstakingly organize my gear, even as the tent simultaneously tried its best to squash and suffocate me. Every task, such as finding and putting on long underwear, was a major victory in these conditions. Finally, at 5 a.m., I was prepared to flee the scene. With a pack full of saturated clothing and with the generous assistance of a milk delivery truck, I was able to descend into the valley and seek out a washing machine and dryer. Small wonder that I panicked when dropped off later that day in the midst of another rainstorm. It felt like a reoccurring nightmare. The feeling of security that I normally possess, knowing that I have a tent and could sleep anywhere, was gone. I could not survive a single night out here. I was working off two hours of sleep, and my spirit felt as battered as my deteriorating rain gear. Help came in the form of a highway worker, who I flagged down and persuaded to drive me to Geranger, which has the most picturesque setting in the whole country, when it isn't raining. I paid for a campsite that night, just to have a dry place to cook dinner, but the following evening I hunkered down onto a cliffside perch, my tent pitched in a blueberry patch about 2,000 feet above a fjord in the terraced town of Geranger. Vindication came with the morning. For the first time in 10 days, the sky was cloudless, and I was breakfasting on cereal with blueberries while looking down upon a scene from the most popular postcard in Norway. The cascades of the Seven Sisters tumbled down the opposite cliff before mingling with the blue waters of Gerengerfjord, and the sight brought joy to my weary soul. I had outlasted the wind, the rain, the cold, and the loneliness of the stranded hitchhiker. Time to soak in the sunshine for a change. Hey friends, thank you. Thank you for all you do to keep the Adventure Sports Podcast alive and well. You listen to our amazing guests. Thanks for that. You join our Facebook group and you share your adventures. That's awesome. You join our ASP members community for discounts and to support the show. Very cool. You donate to our Patreon site. Right on. But most of all, thank you for believing in the show. Thank you for joining with us to reach others to share the great stuff that adventure sports bring. We believe that adventure sports help people to live richer, more fulfilling lives. We believe that the Adventure Sports Podcast is making a positive impact in the world through physical health, emotional health, environmental health, and relational health. We have set the challenging goal of doubling our listener base by February the 28th. Wow, really? After nearly three years, we want to double the number of listeners in just a few weeks? You bet. And you make it possible because you believe in ASP. Thanks in advance for sharing the dream of a healthier, happier world by telling your friends about the Adventure Sports Podcast. Let's double the good. Together, we can do it. It's official. Winter has arrived, and Bent Gate Mountaineering is prepared to help you get ready for your epic winter. Come check out the latest in Alpine Touring, Telemark, NTN, and Splitboarding gear. They have brands like Black Crows, DPS, Dinafit, G3, Icelandic, K2, Technica Blizzard, Arcteryx, Mammoth, Solomon, Vole, Never Summer, Jones, and BCA. And you do need to be safe out there. Bentgate has the latest in avalanche safety gear. 
They have beacons, airbags, shovels, and probes, and they're ready to help you educate yourself on snow safety. They also rent out gear, so you can get your skis and your boots there, as well as your avalanche safety equipment. What's more, they also have free demo ski days at local resorts, so you can try out the latest gear. Now, how much fun does that sound? So swing by Bent Gate in Golden, Colorado, or go to bentgate.com to find your new gear, as well as to get updates on all of their events. You know, we might be smack dab in the middle of winter these days, but spring is really just right around the corner. Make sure you've got one of our lightweight camp stoves ready to go in your pack for when the weather starts turning warmer. Both the 180 stove and the 180 flame are designed to burn the abundant wood fuels you find on the ground instead of requiring you to haul in heavy, messy camp fuels. Take a minute to head on over to our site at www.180tack.com to check out these American-made stoves that are built to last. You'll be helping us, and you'll be helping the Adventure Sports Podcast. Thanks, guys. Well, it looks like we have time for another story this week, so let's jump back to the United States, head over to Wyoming, and check out what's going on in a chapter called Week 9, Head in the Clouds. Once again, I had optimistically chosen a campsite atop the highest hill in a five-mile radius, only to find myself on the path of an oncoming lightning storm. I left my tent to sit on the dry grass and watch as a barrage of golden shafts slashed through the darkness and struck the plains to the west. It was strange not to hear any sounds. No thunder, just the distant yapping and howling of coyotes down in the valley. There was still time to indulge in the thrill of impending danger before the storm arrived and I had to face the consequences of my foolishness. I don't know why I ignore common sense and foolishly gravitate towards these sort of places. It just happens, with great frequency. For example, earlier today I knew I might need to rest an extra day to allow my sore knee to recuperate, so I chose a site in the Bighorn Mountains with a panoramic view. Perhaps like most wild animals, I instinctually feel comfortable when I can survey my surroundings from a high vantage point. If this is true, it might explain my lifelong compulsion to climb trees. However, as a teenager in upstate New York, I also used to slip out of my bedroom window and climb atop the roof of my house simply to watch approaching storms. Lightning has always been an emotional stimulant for me, and this week I was given an abundance of storm-related stimulation. The first thunderstorm passed over my campsite with only a token show of aggression, but I wasn't nearly as lucky two days later when a second storm crossed my path during a backpacking expedition into the Cloud Peak wilderness of northern Wyoming. I had the egotistical ambition to climb Cloud Peak, the highest mountain in the Bighorns, but the summit was, well, lost in a cloud by the time I got there, appropriately enough. Apart from obscuring some 2,000-foot cliffs, the clouds remained harmless until my descent, when they darkened by several shades and began shedding raindrops and hailstones. I had left my warmest clothes back in my tent and was woefully unprepared for the change in the weather. My wet windbreaker clung to my skin and allowed the cold to penetrate deep into my bones. Abandoning plans to spend a second night in the wilderness, I did what I could to keep my blood circulating until I could pack up the tent and return to the trailhead. Snow fell in the higher elevations that evening, which proves that in the Rockies it's best to be prepared for anything, even in the height of summer. After that fiasco, I drove east across the Black Hills of South Dakota past the solemn faces of four dead presidents on Mount Rushmore, to the eroded and otherworldly landscape of Badlands National Park, one of my favorite places on Earth. The mounds and spires in the Badlands look like a miniature Teton mountain range, shrunk to one-tenth the original size and painted in horizontal gray and pink stripes with an ocean of green grasses lapping at their shores. For me, it's the ultimate playground. And it's also famous for storms. As a cloud mass developed ominously to the northwest, I reached a primitive campground within the park and fought the winds to set up my tent and inflatable mattress. The storm seemed to be sucking air towards its center to feed and perpetuate its growth. Eager as a five-year-old, I couldn't wait to finish my dinner so that I could run up the nearest hill and get a better view of the lightning that had begun to flicker horizontally through the lower cloud layers. Now that I was out of the Rockies and in relatively flat country, I could see over 50 miles in every direction from the hilltop above the campground. The storm to the northwest had grown to about the size of New York City, and its leading edges were visibly expanding, billowing outwards and reaching overhead to claim the last remaining stretches of open sky. I was in awe of its magnitude and power, and almost giddy with the thrill of adrenaline-tinged vulnerability. Cascading and fragmenting bolts of thin purple lightning shot laterally across the firmament, as complex as latticework, 
While in the distance, larger bolts discharge their energy straight into the earth with thunderous impact, sending shockwaves reverberating across the plains. Storms have an actual human-like face if your imagination is powerful and you're bold enough to try staring one down until its countenance appears. Raindrops were beginning to strike my back, but I dared myself to remain on the hilltop long enough for the face to be revealed. Finally, I saw it against the bulk of the cloud mass. A devil's face. Not good. Electrical energy was arcing all around me, and it would have been prudent to drop to lower ground. But still I waited and watched, transfixed, as the face shifted and coalesced into... a skull. Oh boy. I thought I was finished, fated for death. Then suddenly everything happened at once. The setting sun fell below the lowest level of the storm mass, undercutting it with golden sun rays and illuminating the droplets of water that were falling beneath. A horde of 100 crows flew across the face of the sun. Then in the opposite direction, above the campground appeared a magnificent rainbow, and lightning flashed through it. Rainbows and lightning! I felt like I was witnessing a clash between positive and negative primordial forces. When the sun was about to set for good and could no longer hold the negative powers at bay, I abandoned my post and escaped to a lower and less vulnerable position. The rumble of thunder was now almost constant, and heat lightning flickered across every corner of the sky as currents of electricity passed back and forth. Thunderbolts fractured and seared violet spiderweb patterns through the air, and I couldn't help but erupt into joyous laughter whenever I glimpsed one. Dime-sized hail gave way to bouts of rain as darkness fell, and I had to retreat to the jeep to continue watching the show. I sat with the interior lights off, eating dry cereal like it was popcorn and looking out through the windshield as if I were parked in a drive-in movie theater. I slept horribly that night, for earplugs can only muffle so many decibels, but I was smiling the following morning, infused of energy from having been witness to nature at its electrifying best. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to read more tales of misadventure, this book, along with my guidebook, Renegade Car Camping, are available for free to my newsletter subscribers. Sign up at www.offthemapbooks.com. Paperback editions of the whole Off the Map trilogy can be found at Amazon.com. Safe travels, everyone. Thanks for listening to this first reading from Brian Snyder. There'll be two more. Brian was on the Adventure Sports Podcast on episode 135 and episode 302, so go back and check those out. If you want to get more information about Brian, you can visit his website at offthemapbooks.com. Be sure to subscribe to his list and get your copies of your free books, and you can also find his books on Amazon. Until the next episode, get out and have some fun.